I started this painting yesterday and as you can see I used a lot of primary colors, secondary colors and that was the idea was to just play and have fun. I did start with some mark making at first and today um, is another day. So what would I do when I have a painting like this that has so many garish colors and um, it's kind of hard to look at right now. When I put the piece back on the wall, I started to work into areas like this that had larger areas that were more grayed down color. What I want to do today is um, just continue to play and work on some of these areas that are really um, still very bright and saturated, knock back some of that saturation. So um, I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you. This can be kind of messy, so I've got, I've got my gloves. And this paper that I've been using, I started to use it yesterday and I use it a lot. Uh, you can get it at any hardware store. Uh, just brown paper, comes in different um, size rolls. Like I've got this size roll and I've got this shorter size roll. There, there are a couple other sizes as well. I believe carpenters use these just to cover maybe the the floor they're walking on. I'm not really sure what they use them for. But anyway, I'm just going to mix some colors. Add, um, I've got a gray here. Again, I'm still working in acrylic. Sometimes I'll add this airbrush, uh, golden airbrush medium to the mixture of acrylic just to get it thinner. It's better than adding water. You don't want to add water to your acrylic because it will, it will compromise the uh, adhesive qualities of your paint. So you don't really want to do that. And I just want to get Again, I'm, I'm just adding more paint, number one. I'm continuing to play, number two. I'm not liking these blatantly white areas. Um, they're just kind of intermittent and I don't want these small shapes because they make my eye go crazy. So I'm just going to um, try and block some of those off. I want these drippy areas. That's why I added the airbrush fluid just to give it a little bit more of that runny quality. I can say I could add a little bit more. And when I add a color like this, it's, it's a grayed down orange as you can see. Hopefully you can see that. And it's a grayed down color and it's a little bit transparent because I've added that airbrush medium. So, you know, I can do that, covering up these white areas. Makes it a little easier for the eye to look at this painting, but it's far from, far from, you know, easy enough to look at this painting. It's certainly not anywhere near <laughs> what I'd like it to be. That's okay. That's not my goal so far. And I do have two panels going on right now. I'm just going to treat them as if they're one. And these little areas that have a lot of color, um, I'm just going to let those go because I don't mind as long as there's not a whole lot of white in there. I, 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 uh, I know that some people say, well, why would you start a painting with so much color when you're going to then go and cover it all up? Well, um, as you'll see from my close-up, when I zoom in on that, you can see that when I scrape back um, in areas like this or here, you know, you're not going to get that variegated color unless you've done something pretty dramatic in those early stages. So that's why. It's because it's, it's there. It, even though it's covered up, it, it is there. And you, if you take sandpaper or an orbital sander and you want to 
you know, reveal later on, well, if you want to reveal something kind of exciting, surprising, interesting, you can't reveal that unless you did it in the earlier stages. So that's the answer to why, you know, people say, well, why are you wasting all that paint, you know? Because you're covering it up now. Well, remember, it's still there. It dried. It's still there. And it can be excavated. It's kind of like archaeology when you're Think of it in terms of you buried this wonderful color and then it got buried in all these other layers of color and you feel like, well, yeah, it's still there. So um, if, if anything, it allows you to be really free. It's a great way to start a painting because you're not worried about, you know, things and it's really fun to play with this color. It helps you to remember what it was like when you were really young and you didn't have to worry about anything. Um, just getting that into that mode of thought is so valuable that even if that was the only thing that happened, by starting in that way, and let's say that you couldn't reveal this paint later on, to me that in itself would be worth it to feel like that child again, not feel any intimidation, inhibition, to be completely spontaneous um, as you were as a child, I mean, that's invaluable. So I've now put a lot of this, you know, this what grayish orange on here, and I'm trying to be, I'm not really standing back at this point, but I do have a sense of how much I'm moving around the overall, you know, uh, square footage or inches of this piece. I'm trying to be. Um, an equal opportunity painter for this color. I don't want to only have it on one side and not the other or you know only on the top and not on the bottom only on the edges and not in the middle so at this point I'm just adding paint kind of all all over. I like to think of it as a bee pollinating a garden and I actually really kind of like this color that's going on so I'm going to actually add I'm going to switch it a little bit. I'm going to continue to use orange um, add a little bit of gray but I want to shift in the color so anytime that I'm mixing up new paint I mean I have to ask the question why would I do the same thing twice when you have all these wonderful colors and I mean it'd be boring to just have that one value that one uh, gray when it can be something else so I always try to when I go back into uh, changing the color or if I ran out of color and I'm going to mix some more I'm not certainly not going to try and match what I just had um, I'm going to try and change it so now you'll see that what I've mixed is slightly more red and I actually want it even a little bit more red than that I just don't want the very same you know value and hue I want it to be a little different you'll see the difference here here's the difference Okay, so, and I, it's drippy. I added more airbrush medium. Again, that's what makes things interesting to me is using this, uh, using gravity. I like all these drips because later when I go back to sand things, um, these drip marks are thicker. They'll always be thicker than, you know, when I um, smoothed it out with the brush. They're just, you know, by nature, thicker. So I like to make these drippy marks so that I have a sense of that texture later on and you can do things with your brush to encourage it to drip. Number one, making it of course more drippy with the airbrush medium. And again, I'm not standing far enough back to even see what I'm doing and that's kind of a, at this stage, that's what I want. If I was trying to be critical of this painting, I'd be standing halfway across the studio but I'm not doing that and I am just at close range trying to close gaps and gaps by gaps what I mean is the whitish areas um,
Of course, the biggest advantage to starting off a big painting like this with acrylic is drying time. You know, if I had done this in cold wax and oil, um, I wouldn't be able to make the painting progress as quickly. And there is a time and a place, you know, for everything. And in this case, by starting with acrylic, I can at least get, you know, a lot of, like I said, a lot of paint here. Um, a lot of things to work with and but I it's not that I um, I like acrylic when you work this big though it's sometimes hard to continue to work um, because of the the fact that acrylic unlike oil and cold wax dries so quickly so sometimes you just need more time and that's when it's really a good thing to uh, if you enjoy cold wax and oil, that would be, that's a great advantage of being able to work in both mediums. You can use them both to your advantage when the time is right. I mean, the value right now is um, predominantly like this mid-tone medium to mid-tone dark. And I'm really happy with that because I'm pretty sure I want to go lighter later. And so this is the perfect thing to go underneath that because there will be a nice contrast where I decide to let it peek through in that lighter, higher value later. So again, trying to make these areas of white smaller. I can cover a lot of ground fast because the paint has been thinned. And I'm not trying to cover all these areas of high intensity, high saturated areas. I, I, I like some of them. I just don't want as many of them. And, and also, again, like I said, these whites are kind of like headlights to me. They are so, so bright. They just really stand out. I want to be very selective where I let those whites shine through. And that is more of a uh, end game decision. It's not anything that um, I need to decide now. Right now what they serve as is an annoyance and that's why you know I, I um, not that I'm trying to be plan this out too much or anything I just know that um, in order for me to evaluate this painting and uh, move forward with enthusiasm and excitement, I need to allow my eye to see the painting without all these constant headlights shining in my face. <laughs> Sometimes that can shut you down, you know, you don't know what's wrong with your painting, but then you notice that you've got all these white areas um, that can be quite blinding. They actually are blinding. And again, when I changed this color from what was, um, you know, pretty an orange gray to now more of a, a red orange gray, I am pushing the painting in the direction of a warm dominance. That doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. It just means that for now, even the, these gray areas like here and uh, this green is a warm green. This, this uh, gray here is a, a very dark reddish gray reddish gray um, and those are warm colors so in some ways I'm also setting up at least for now a temperature dominance again that's not something that I'm going to be too concerned about at this point I'm just making an observation and telling you that it is something I'm aware of and if you're aware of it at a stage when you're playing get used to being aware of it at a stage when you're playing then the reason that's helpful is that when it matters, you will have practiced so much on these early layers where it didn't matter that when it does matter, you'll still have, you'll, you will have increased your ability to see that way. And that's again why I spend time making marks in every layer because again, it, every time you do something like that, you are improving your ability, you're practicing that ability, you're adding to those 10,000 hours of mark making that we all know you need to have in order to own it, in order to, you know, marks that are yours are marks that, that you've done so many times and whenever you have an opportunity to continue to make marks, why not make them so that it 
um, always feels as normal and natural as possible. So here I have my marks, my mark making tools. I've got this tray of different things. Um, these are all my favorite mark making tools. Some are dark, some are, I've even got a white woody here. Some are thick, some are thin. Again, you know, why not come in and make marks now? Just because the paint's wet? If I was three years old, I wouldn't care if the paint was wet. And in the same way, I don't care if it's wet now. So I am just um, playing. This is my way of being able to play. I'm not standing back. I'm not being critical. And I don't even really care, you know, how thick the the edge of my tool is. I'm just trying to practice my mark making in a way, um, or play. I should say play with my mark making. Um, the other thing is that. You know, you can also use an eraser, um, which is really cool. Okay, so I'm going to show you a close-up of, of what I'm doing here. This is the eraser, and this paint is wet, and it's acrylic. But you can see how, you see how when I pull that eraser through, I'm revealing the color underneath. And that is also a very different kind of mark. And again, if I hadn't played with all these crazy... Um, psychedelic colors and then look what happens down here I mean it's not just you know this is I'm, I'm creating these uh, lines and shapes but look at this interesting thing that's happening down here if I move over here you know this is a very wet paint you can see it glistening um, again uh, just remember that mark making is it can be additive but it can also be in this case subtractive I can even add you know somewhat of a pattern I commonly, during the painting process, will take photographs uh, of the, you know, still photographs so that I can put together a file later on, sometimes a PowerPoint or whatever, and document the, the more dramatic changes in a painting. And I find it to be really helpful. Uh, why? Because sometimes, you know, we get so uh, stuck with our work and we, can start to lack confidence and say to ourselves, well, I'm really stuck and I don't know what to do. Well, when you document progression like this, you can almost always find some stage that your painting was in where you were equally stuck or maybe more stuck. And then maybe you finish this painting and you've got the final thing. But to be able to look back um, weeks, months, years, um, before that painting was finished, when it first got started, and you remember all the uh, times when you were, were really stuck, it's very helpful to have images that show that. So, like by the time this painting's finished, I might have lost all this intense color, um, except for maybe tiny, tiny little bits, but it will show me that, yes, it was important to start that way because I couldn't have gotten this effect now if I hadn't done that. So I'll just basically go around and take shots of um, different parts of the painting. I'll do close-ups, I'll do you know, shots that are kind of far away and throw them into a file on my computer on the hard drive and just as reference, it's kind of fun.